In the infinite black void of space, there is no air, no sound, only silence so complete it swallows everything. Here, the sun does not rise or set. It burns in the distance, casting light that never truly warms. The earth, once vast and endless, shrinks to a fragile blue dot, suspended in an ocean of nothingness. Space is not made for the living. It is cold, indifferent, a place where a single mistake is a death sentence. Yet, humanity has always reached for the impossible. We built machines to defy gravity, to cross the void, to touch the heavens themselves. But space does not yield easily. It is a place where nature does not forgive, where survival is borrowed time. And the Apollo 13 mission would soon show the world just how horrifying space can be. In the early years of the Cold War, space became the ultimate proving ground for dominance. The Soviet Union struck first, launching Sputnik in 1957, the first artificial satellite to orbit Earth. Then came Vostok 1 in 1961, carrying Yuri Gagarin, the first man to leave the planet. The world watched as the Soviets seemed unstoppable, while the United States scrambled to keep pace. But in 1969, everything changed. With Apollo 11, the United States achieved the impossible. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin set foot on the moon, fulfilling President Kennedy's bold promise to land a man there before the decade was out. It was a moment that rewrote history. With Apollo 12, the moon landings continued, proving that the first had not been a fluke. The missions were no longer just about beating the Soviets. They were about pushing human exploration further than ever before. Then came Apollo 13. On April 11, 1970, three men climbed into the command module Odyssey, ready to embark on NASA's third lunar landing. Jim Lovell, the veteran commander, had already been to space three times. He had orbited the moon during Apollo 8, the first mission to leave Earth's orbit. Now, he would finally walk on its surface. Fred Hayes, the lunar module pilot, was a rookie astronaut, but an experienced test pilot. He had trained tirelessly for months, preparing to explore the moon's surface. Jack Swiger, the command module pilot, was a last-minute replacement. Originally, Ken Mattingly had been assigned to the mission, but a medical scare grounded him days before launch. He would watch the launch from Houston's mission control. Swigert had little time to adjust. He was stepping into one of the most dangerous jobs in the world, with only days to prepare. At exactly 2.13 p.m. Eastern Time, the engines of the Saturn V roared to life, shaking the Earth beneath it. Inside, Jim Lovell, Fred Hayes, and Jack Swigert were strapped into their seats, feeling the force of millions of pounds of thrust pressing them back. Minutes later, the first and second stages of the rocket detached, falling away as planned. The third stage fired, pushing Apollo 13 toward the moon. But before continuing, the crew had to rearrange their spacecraft. The lunar module, Aquarius, was stored inside the third stage. So the astronauts first separated the command module Odyssey and turned it around in space. They then carefully docked Odyssey to Aquarius and pulled it free from the third stage. With both modules securely connected, the empty rocket stage was discarded and Apollo 13 was now fully assembled for its journey. Apollo 13 drifted through the quiet expanse, nearly 200,000 miles from home. Inside, the crew went about their routine. Jim Lovell checked their position, making sure they stayed on course. Fred Hayes ran tests on the lunar module, while Jack Swigert handled navigation and kept in touch with mission control. They talked with Houston like it was just another day at the office. Light-hearted, confident, they joked about missing dinner with their families, about how these missions were starting to feel almost routine. In the small cabin of Odyssey, they floated between tasks, passing equipment back and forth, filling the silence with small talk. As Apollo 13 coasted through the void, Jack Swigert received a routine request from Mission Control. Stir the cryo tanks. He flipped the switch. A loud bang was heard that shook the spacecraft. Warning lights flashed, alarms blared. Jim Lovell turned to the window. What he saw sent a chill through him. 
venting gas escaping into space. Their oxygen was leaking. Inside Odyssey, the quiet routine of moments ago was gone. In its place, a terrifying realization that something had gone very, very wrong. The crew snapped to attention. Jim Lovell's eyes shot to the controls, voltage dropping, oxygen pressure plummeting. Fred Hayes checked the lunar module, hoping for stability. Jack Swigert gripped the radio. Then came the words that would be etched into history. Across 200,000 miles of emptiness, those words reached mission control. On the ground, engineers froze. A split second of disbelief, then chaos. Dozens of flight controllers sprang into action, scanning consoles, searching for answers. At first, nothing made sense. The readings blurred together, power failures, system malfunctions, cascading alerts. Then the realization hit. One of their oxygen tanks had exploded. Their lifeline was bleeding into space, and Apollo 13 was now in a fight for survival. At the start, Apollo 13 had barely made the news. The world had already seen men walk on the moon. Another mission, another landing. Television networks didn't even bother broadcasting the crew's live transmissions. The public had moved on, but now, everything was different. When the news broke, There is a bulletin from ABC News. The Apollo 13 spacecraft has had a serious power supply malfunction that could cause the lunar landing mission to be terminated early. It spread like wildfire. An American spacecraft crippled, drifting nearly 200,000 miles from Earth, its crew in danger. The world stopped to watch. Newspapers ran front page headlines. Radios played constant updates. Families huddled around televisions, waiting for any word from space. NASA, once battling for attention, now had every eye on them. But there was no time to focus on the world watching. In mission control, engineers fought to understand the damage. The explosion had knocked out one of the spacecraft's main oxygen tanks, and the second was draining fast. Without oxygen, they would lose power. Without power, they would freeze. Without a solution, they wouldn't make it home. The clock was ticking. The new mission was clear, keep the crew alive and find a way to bring them home. With Odyssey crippled, the astronauts had no choice but to abandon it and move into Aquarius. The lunar module was never meant to be a lifeboat. It was designed to sustain two men for just two days on the moon, not three men for a journey back to Earth, but it was their only hope. The situation was growing dire. Inside Aquarius, the temperature had dropped to just above freezing. The astronauts shivered in their flight suits, their breath visible in the dim light. Moisture collected on the walls and equipment, forming droplets that floated through the cabin. But the cold wasn't just uncomfortable, it was a serious threat. If water condensed inside the spacecraft's electronics, it could cause a short circuit, shutting down what little power they had left. Meanwhile, Odyssey had been powered down completely to save energy for re-entry. It was now a lifeless shell dark and freezing, waiting for the moment it would be needed again. The astronauts were running the entire mission from Aquarius, a vehicle never meant to sustain them for this long. Every resource had to be rationed. Power was limited, forcing them to navigate and communicate with only the bare essentials. Drinking water was scarce, and dehydration became a real concern. The lithium hydroxide canisters, designed to scrub carbon dioxide from the air, were filling up faster than expected. Without a solution, the cabin would slowly turn into a suffocating prison. At mission control, engineers raced to find answers. They devised a way to fit the square lithium hydroxide canisters from Odyssey into the round openings of Aquarius, using nothing but plastic bags, tape, and pages from the flight manual. It was a desperate makeshift solution, but it worked, buying the crew more time. But time was still running out. The spacecraft was crippled, resources were dwindling, and they were still hundreds of thousands of miles from Earth. The original mission was long gone. Now, there was only one objective, survival. For nearly three days, the crew remained in Aquarius, battling the cold and exhaustion. Inside, 
the temperature had dropped to just above freezing. Every movement was sluggish. Sleep was brief and restless, interrupted by shivers and the constant awareness that they were running out of time. Meanwhile, Mission Control worked around the clock, running simulations and calculations to find a way home. Returning on their original course was impossible. The explosion had sent them off trajectory. The best option was to use the moon's gravity to slingshot Apollo 13 back toward Earth, a maneuver that would save fuel and keep them on course. But there was another problem. Their current path would take them too far off course for a safe re-entry. The trajectory had to be adjusted, and with Odyssey powered down, they had no access to the onboard guidance systems. That meant the astronauts would have to perform a critical burn manually, using only visual alignment and a stopwatch to ensure precision. With no room for error, Mission Control devised a simple but risky plan. The astronauts would use Aquarius's engine to make the correction, aligning their spacecraft by sight keeping Earth centered in the window while they fired the thrusters. It was a delicate, high-stakes operation, but it worked. Apollo 13 was now on a course home, yet the danger was far from over. With Odyssey shut down, Aquarius had become their lifeboat, but it was running out of power and supplies. The next major challenge would be the most difficult yet, reawakening Odyssey after days of freezing darkness and preparing it for re-entry. The crew had made it this far, but one final hurdle remained, powering up Odyssey for re-entry. It had been shut down for nearly four days, its systems cold and dormant. Restarting it was a delicate task. Too much power at once could short-circuit the spacecraft, but they needed just enough to bring the critical systems online. Mission Control devised a meticulous step-by-step -step startup sequence, something never tested before. With only a fraction of the usual power available, every switch flipped had to be carefully timed. Jack Swigert followed the instructions precisely, rerouting power from Aquarius to awaken Odyssey. Slowly, the command module came back to life, navigation, communications, and guidance systems flickering on one by one. But with power so limited, there was no room for error. If the systems failed now, they had no backup plan. The spacecraft had to be ready for re-entry. Finally, after a tense and careful process, Odyssey was operational again. The crew transferred back into the command module, sealing themselves inside for the final descent. Aquarius, the spacecraft that had kept them alive, was now no longer needed. Just before re-entry, they jettisoned it into space, watching as it drifted away, never to be seen again. Now, only one challenge remained, surviving the fiery plunge back to Earth. With Aquarius gone, the crew braced for the final test, re-entry. They were now completely reliant on Odyssey, a spacecraft that had spent days in freezing conditions, its systems barely holding together. As they accelerated toward Earth, the spacecraft slammed into the upper atmosphere at nearly 25,000 miles per hour. The air around them ignited, creating a blazing trail across the sky. Inside, the astronauts felt the crushing force of deceleration. Their bodies pressed into their seats as the temperature outside soared to thousands of degrees. Then came the moment of silence. As expected, the plasma surrounding the capsule disrupted communication with mission control. For three minutes, radio contact was lost, a standard blackout period. But as the seconds stretched on, tension in mission control mounted. Three minutes passed, then four, then five. The room was silent every second feeling like an eternity.
I recall, Captain, that when I spoke to you on the phone, you said that you regretted that you were unable to complete your mission. I hereby declare that this was a successful mission. From the start, the exploration of space has been hazardous adventure. The voyage of Apollo 13 dramatized its risks. The men of Apollo 13, by their poise and skill, under the most intense kind of pressure, epitomize the character that accepts danger and surmounts it. Against all odds, they had made it. At 12.07 p.m. on April 17, 1970, Odyssey splashed down in the Pacific Ocean. The crew, exhausted, dehydrated, but alive, had returned home. A mission that should have ended in tragedy became one of NASA's greatest triumphs not for landing on the moon, but for surviving the impossible. Apollo 13 was not a story of conquest, but of resilience, of human ingenuity, teamwork, and the will to defy fate itself. In space, even the smallest failure can be fatal. But on that April night in 1970, failure was not an option. And because of that, three men lived to tell the tale. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. It really helps the channel grow. And thank you so much for watching. See you in the next one.